Blomcast. Turning Points in History. Wendepunkte in der Geschichte. Welcome to the Blomcast, the podcast in which we look at turning points in history. And today's guest is an expert in turning points in a way that is really, really rare today. He is the author most recently of Culture, the story of us from, from cave painting to K-pop, but he is also the editor of the Norton Anthology of World Literature, and he has written a book that I hope we will come to speaking about later, Literature for a Changing Planet. In short, if you want to know what Martin Puchner has written, go on Wikipedia and look it up. There are lots of books, some academic and increasingly more for a great and general public. Martin, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having you on your podcast. Martin Puchner, you are a professor at Harvard for Comparative Literature. Um, in the German world where we both come from, it is not the done thing to do big picture research, to do big picture stories. You're supposed to be an expert in what happened in Weimar between 1826 and 1828. And um, if you venture beyond that, then you're just seen as not a particularly serious scholar. Now, um, you as I are sort of sweeping the millennia, which looks grossly irresponsible. How did you come to do that? Well, it's funny you should mention it because I think I used to be an expert on Weimar between 1926 and 1928. So I guess I have those street credentials. Uh, now, I really started as a modernist. And so that, I mean, not just in Weimar, but in other European capitals uh, of you know early 20th century. So I love that period, and I also get the importance of going deep and you know spending a lot of time with one subject matter. But I, I think sort of two things happened. Uh, on the one hand, I'm an impatient person, so I just couldn't bear to spend my whole career with this one subject. But then the other thing that happened is that I sort of stumbled into this job of becoming the general editor of this world literature anthology, a, a massive six volume undertaking that really was supposed to cover all of literature. And so, you know, it wasn't just me, it was a whole team. And in sort of preparing for that, I started to read world history because I feel like, well, since I'm doing world literature, I better read up on some world history. And then I started to look for sort of the equivalent in literature and culture and found that it just didn't really exist precisely because of what you said. I had a very good friend. I saw that you um, were housed for a while in Wolfson College in Oxford. Um, that's where I did my graduate studies. And that's where I met a predecessor of yours in the Norton, Norton anthologies, John Stallworthy, whom you may have heard of. And John was a wonderful poet, also a Norton editor, and he always talked about the Nobel Prize for Literature and said, you know, it's just absurd. How do you, how do you compare a Japanese play with a Hebrew poem? Um, you know, how do you can can you establish any criteriums of quality in that kind of context? So how do you do that if you edit a world anthology of literature? Yeah, the 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 good thing, I, I, and I mean, it's impossible. I mean, let's just start with that, it's impossible. Okay. But the good thing, what makes it a little bit more possible is that the purpose of, and I came to learn this over many years, that it's really the purpose of the, this particular anthology isn't primarily to establish quality and to say, okay, you know, you are in world literature, you're, you're just regional literature or something like that. It's really this anthology has a very particular purpose, and that is to serve as a textbook for a certain type of course in North America, namely a kind of sweeping world literature survey of a kind that doesn't really exist in Europe or in many other in any other place. World Lit 101. Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's sort of Lit 101, or even, but it's actually before Lit 101. It's really a part of the kind of general education mandate of the American liberal arts education. So it's not just, you know, quality period it's a teaching purpose and for american students to get to teach them something about the world and its literature now tell me one thing i mean i want to talk to you about stories about 
the power and importance of storytelling, something that I've also done done some work on. And but also you you know, we're looking at turning points in history and you've spent a book dedicated to book to one particular turning point that I think we hugely underestimate. Um, I think now with AI we may be at another such point and we're also underestimating that. But yes, it's writing. It's the very simple technology of writing uh, which you have followed throughout its evolution but um, it reminded me a little bit of, you know, today we're talking where there's so many of our discourse in t- is in terms of race and what makes meaningful differences between people. And there were times in the 19th century when anthropologists, men with long beards, um, genuinely tried to make the case that people who were from unlettered cultures, who, people who were illiterate, were effectively another species. And that this key technology somehow became part of biological evolution and um, made us into different kinds of animals. Now, that seems to be overstating the case, but only slightly. Uh, In terms of what what you described, what certain 19th century ideas, it's true. And it's, it's interesting, as I was writing this book, The Written World, thinking about the importance of writing technologies and then different inventions within that world, such as paper and print and so on and so forth. I was always, I I think I reminded myself of that problematic history in the 19th century and always had to, but I felt like I had to remind myself of it because it was so tempting to write a kind of triumphalist history, how great writing is. It allows you to speak to the future and read voices from the past and project words across space and creating all these literate genres and, you know, informing what I spent my life and you also, what we spend our lives doing. So the, the temptation somehow or the danger of overestimating that was very great. Um, and sort of in the, in the course of writing this book, I started to think very seriously about oral storytelling and ended up trying to write a book that looks at the relation between different writing systems and different writing technologies and oral storytelling as sort of an intertwined system and not as sort of one replacing the other. This is why I have sort of chapters on the African epic of Sunjata and, you know, poetry under Stalin where poets like Anna Ahmatova didn't dare to write things down anymore and so on and so forth. And then contemporary internet, as you point out, where we have sort of this revival through TikTok and YouTube of oral forms of recitation and poetry. That's an interesting, that's an interesting way of, of, of looking at it, this revival of oral. Um, but, but, but do tell me, I mean, what has, why was writing such a vast change to, to culture? I mean, it's easy to see that, you know, we can, we can store knowledge, um, but why is it such a qualitative jump? that comes through that? It's a really fascinating question. And it it takes us to what's today Iraq, namely Mesopotamia, where the cuneiform writing system was sort of the first full writing system. And it's interesting to see what was transformative there. And just this fall, I actually, for the first time, finally managed to go to Iraq and go to some of these places where writing is said to have been invented, including the now abandoned city of Uruk. Uh, where there is a sign that says writing was invented here. Uh, Otherwise, the site is completely inaccessible. We had to get permission from the minister to even get there. And it's heavily guarded uh, because of all the looting and all the political unrest. But they do have that sign, writing was invented here. So it was fun to see that. I was struck, you know, this in, in this invention of writing and the first story that humanity at least records, Gilgamesh, um, Gilgamesh is a very modern hero of literature, isn't he? He's a flawed hero. Very flawed. He tries to do something that he can't do. He's afraid of death. And he is at war with the part of him that is nature, the part of him that is mortal. And really, you know, you, in, in another book, you take us to the Chauvin cave and you take us to cave painting. Now, I once read this wonderful sentence that art was never bad, 
We haven't yet found a hundred caves where people for 10,000 years tried to figure out how to draw an animal. The first cave paintings that we have are masterworks. And we seem to have learned very little in the meantime, both in graphic arts and in narrative arts. If we look at Gilgamesh, I mean, that guy could be walking around today and he would still be challenging. I think that's so true. And, you know, it just shows that I think our minds are still so shaped by a kind of technological story of progress that we expect that. And in a sense, it brings us back to the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century, where that story of progress really coalesced and, and became so broad that even today, we somehow expect progress in, in the arts and in philosophy. But isn't that just the Christian salvation story in disguise? Isn't that pure theology? I mean, it, it's something. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's pure Christianity because, you know, Christianity has its own millennialism and had a different sort of temporal. I, I, my money, my culprit would be the kind of 18th, 19th century industrialization technology. That's, I think, the big, big progress story. And, you know, we all, we are not surprised that the iPhone 14 is better than the iPhone 12, but whether, then we expect the same with cave with cave painting and literature, and that's the mistake. We <laughs> we're likely to see everything as a succession of versions that may or may not be um, doing what we want. Let's let's briefly touch on this book where we take us to the cave, um, the story of us. It is really, I mean, as far as modest little projects go, this is probably one of the more modest. Um, it's just, you, you blankly ask, what is culture? And I was particularly struck by the idea that you say we're far too obsessed with origins, with who has done something first. And, you know, writing was invented here. And we sort of fixate on that, and you, we think that's the great achievement. But you sort of say all the interesting stuff is really backloaded. That's true. And I think this, it's connected uh, uh, to that question of, you know, technological process, pro pro progress and invention. And I feel like that has that story has sort of seeped into culture. And there is so much investment, cultural pride in, you know, origin stories and who has invented that, what and fights over these kinds of inventions. And what really struck me when I did take this bird's eye view of culture and ask sort of what is culture? How does it work really? How did it develop? The thing that really stands out is that different cultural inventions circulate, they combine, they emerge you know, in, into new, they combine into new forms. What matters is not who invented what, but what we do with what we find or inherit or glean from others or misunderstand and make our own. And that's that we are all latecomers when it comes to culture. There's always someone who did something in some cave before us. And that, so that I really started to think about this whole, to flip it the story of origins to the story of late commerce. And that also brings a certain freedom. It gets us off the hook with this kind of competition among cultures, who was first, who was second, and also gives us a certain freedom, I think, to pick and choose, if you will, from the past and from other cultures. You started your academic career as a modernist. And you looked at modernism, and really modernism's great ambition was to break with those traditions, to stop that idea of culture, and to be entirely original and step into the world anew. Today, you know, you see a lot of broken continuities, but you also have the feeling that that is really a grandiose failure because we've become more atavistic than ever. Yeah. It, can you say a little bit more about that? Well... You know, it always strikes me, for instance, if you look at contemporary art, um, abandoning a common language makes things much freer because you're not tied to one tradition where you can only say things in a certain way. But it also makes things much more difficult to understand. If I hear a classical piece of music, I can have a reasonable idea of 
it's in, it, the quality of its interpretation of whether it's interestingly played or not, whether it has something to say or not. If I have hear a piece of Persian music, I have the greatest problems doing that because I, I'm, I lack the context yeah. of my hearing. And really, of course, that means that if you, if you abandon the common language that a tradition spoke in which you can shock people, in which you can reinvent yourself, in which you can rebel against all that. If you abandon that common language, you have to say things in terribly simple sentences to be still comprehensible. Yeah, yeah, now, now I see what you mean. Yes, no, I mean, it's sort of a critique of modernism, really, that you're articulating. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I understand. And I think I have, I think my, I've come to, I think, two positions. One, one is that, that the modernist project is breaking with tradition and so on and so forth. The, the singular focus on the breaking of tradition was extreme and in some sense maybe misguided. At the same time, now when I look at modernism and, you know, I'm far from the first person to point this out, I'm also struck by that actually many of the modernists did that also, even though they said they were only breaking with tradition and so on and so forth. They were great archaeologists. Ezra Pound is a great example, but you could name almost anyone, you know, Picasso and Greek antiquity. And I mean, you just name it. So I think that when, when you know, when I was young and foolish and sort of believed the modernist story about themselves, uh, uh, and if I look at that story, oh, we need to, you know, down with the past and so on and so forth, I've come to a very different position. But I actually think that the modernists themselves had a much more nuanced project, most of them anyway, um, and were actually much more deeply engaged with the past that, than, that, than they pretended to be or that they knew they were. So, yeah. That engagement with the past is a fascinating thing. I live in Vienna. And not so far away from here is a square in which you can see two churches, uh, the uh, Scottish church and uh, another one. And they're both Baroque and, you know, with all those scrolls and little naked angels that Baroque churches have to have. But at a second glance, you see one of them is Romanesque and comes from the 12th century or so, and another one is Gothic and came from the 13th century or so. But what happened? was that in the 18th century, somebody had a lot of money that he gave to the church, and then they hacked away all those boring old sculptures and painted over all those rustic old um, frescoes and modernized the church because that was what you did, because you lived in a living tradition and things had no particular value simply because they were old. Now, if today, to stay in Vienna, some great modern architect would donate a new facade to St. Stephen's Cathedral and say, you know, we just take down what's there and we build something out of steel and glass, I think, you know, people wouldn't be all that understanding. But it seems to me that our approach, our approach that is so, on the one hand, so totally reckless when it comes to natural resources, but on the other hand, when it comes to culture, sort of culture with a capital C, um, we are so conservation-oriented. We are so fearful of making judgments. We are so fearful of letting anything go, simply because we notice that we are no longer part of a living continuum. There is something that is finished now and needs to be preserved. Yeah, Do you yeah. think it's going too far? No, no, I, I think you're right. It's sort of culture with a capital K, really. You're talking yes, about. <laughs> yes. No, I've come also to think that this kind of fetish of the original is really a strange thing. And as you, you notice that when you go to Asia, where, where there's a very different, where you just, you know, temples are being rebuilt. They're made out of wood. They're being rebuilt every 20 years or 50 years. But they're still thought of as being a thousand years old. Exactly. And in some sense, they're all, they are because they're in continual use. The architecture stays more or less the same. Maybe there are some small changes, but it's, it's, it's a living, continuous tradition that is very old. But isn't that a very different concept of culture? It, it's a completely different concept. But even, you know, I remember uh, learning at some point that Goethe, 
had all these plaster casts of, you know, Roman statues. And I was shocked. I thought, good, he's the pinnacle of culture. You can't just have copies. You need originals. But he couldn't care less about copies. Uh, he, he was very happy with copies. And so I think this kind of, you know, the romance of the ruin and leaving everything, that it's sort of a late 18th, 19th century. Again, we are ba I keep bashing the 19th century. I should think more about that. But in any case, it's... And so, you know, I think about this question, just fetish of the original also in the context of the whole restitution debate of objects, you know, original objects acquired under dubious circumstances in European or American museums. And I do think that there are valid claims to return some of them. But I think also we should allow ourselves to make copies. And, and uh, yeah, I think for, you know, 99.9, yeah, if you want a carbon date something yeah then you can't use a copy but for most other uses um there i think they can be great and museums like the baghdad museum because so many objects are in europe or have were looted ha ha they have actually quite a few copies and you know that that can be very effective that's exactly the mechanism that you're describing and it's also a mechanism that um, the literary critic Harold Bloom described and he had found this beautiful term for it, a map of misreading. And that culture is really one sort of series of creative misunderstandings after another. And when you look at the dissemination, for instance, of those plaster casts, but also on printed works based on them, because, of course, the fewest people in the 18th century could actually travel to Greece or Rome, so they had etchings. And those etchings were made by artists who'd been trained in Italy or the Netherlands and did things like you did them in Italy or the Netherlands, and they adjusted things slightly, and that's the versions that people came to knew and then copied. So already you have these steps in between. No, and it, you know, I'm... I'm very torn because, you know, in my own books, I try to get things right. I try to understand the original context. That's important. It's part of, you know, what you do as a scholar. But at the same time, I've come to exactly the conclusion that you articulate and that, you know, Harold Bloom and others saw before, namely this, the dynamic of misreading and misunderstanding and projection that creates the dynamic of culture. And so it's, it's odd because I feel like my own sort of professional ethos somehow goes against that. So what am I doing? Is that your fault or is that the fault of the ethos? I, well, that I don't know. You tell me. Well, I mean, I think the ethos here has something to answer for, actually. Um, partly also possibly because um, our disciplines have been a lot, quite a lot infected by the mania of telling thing, uh, counting things and quantifying things. Um, and, you know, literary studies are about careful readings, but they're also about interesting positions, interesting misunderstandings. Um, they're also about starting an intellectual process and, you know, getting a point out there and see that people, whether people tear you apart or not. Um, I, I, I must say I really admire you that you have been able to make your career inside the university system. I quite quickly saw that with my quirky interests I would never flourish in that kind of surroundings. Um, but I feel that our disciplines have got, become very conservative intellectually often, never mind the fact that then you get the journal editors and the, the, the pressure to publish and, you know, this intellectual conformis conformism that comes with that. So I don't think that the humanities are actually in great shape to give us inspiration in that way. No, it, it's true. And it's odd because people in the humanities often when confronted with, oh, what are you guys doing? What are you contributing? Why are you important? They will say some things like critical thinking and creativity. Uh, and, and I always say, you know, those would be very good ideas. Yes, they are important. Creativity and critical thinking are very, very important. I'm not sure like the humanities as they are currently practiced are very good at teaching either, actually. And so maybe we need to start you know, believing our own propaganda and start to live up to those claims a little bit more. I agree. One of the subjects that you touch on that has become quite, quite a big subject in the last few years um, it reminds me I was, I was watching a concert with, together with my wife um, on the iPad. Uh, it was the Tokyo Symphony Orchestra. 
um, in beautiful white tails playing a Beethoven symphony. And my, my, my wife said, oh, look, cultural appropriation. Um, and yes, that sounds fairly absurd, but um, this is a big debate and it has many fairly absurd offshoots. And on the other, on the one hand, what always... What always worries me, there, is, there are so very necessary and justified interests behind this. And it is in some aspects so very important. But it sort of frays out into, into debates that are almost religious in their intensity. I agree. And, you know, I've thought a lot about it and let my publisher sort of talk me into offering this as one of the hooks for the book, although that's not... Uh, you know, I, I was really more interested in thinking about how culture works rather than wading into the uh, cultural appropriation debate. But it's true that if you take this bird's eye view of culture, I think there you get you gain a certain vantage point on this debate. And I think what I've come away with so far is that when people use this term cultural appropriation, they're actually talking about a couple of different things. Sometimes what they're trying to avoid by using this term, cultural appropriation, oh, don't practice cultural appropriation, is really shallow, ignorant uses of another culture. The famous example is these students at Oberlin College, a very leftist liberal arts college in America, who complained that the cafeteria was offering this international food section with banh mi sandwiches, but they were terrible banh mi sandwiches. They got everything wrong. So, and, and, and the same with sushi. So they, they screamed cultural appropriation, but they didn't mean certain, if, and they used this term, but I'm pretty convinced that they didn't mean to say only Japanese people should be allowed to eat sushi, but they said, you know, make a better effort if you go to the trouble of doing sushi or banh mi sandwiches. Try to get it right. Be respectful. Make an effort. You know, learn something about it. So that's sort of one thing. And then in other cases, it's more to avoid these kind of crassly exploitative and commercial uh, you know, for users of another culture. So recently, Beyonce was dragged on Twitter because she had used these henna tattoos and, you know, didn't know that much about these South Indian traditions. And, and, but it's not, you know, if, if it hadn't been Beyonce, who, you know, of course has financial gains from all of the, it had just been someone else, I think they would have been fine. So I think I've started to think, let's, be clear about what we, yes, I'm, I'm against crassly exploitative, you know, commercial uses of culture. I'm against really terrible banh mi sandwiches. I'm also for returning some objects that were clearly stolen or acquired under dubious circumstances. But the thinking about culture ultimately as something that's owned by individuals or groups, I think that's just misguided. But I mean, that's what I mean, because I don't want to be sort of um, stupidly provocative here, but I want to make a real point, um, which is that, you know, if, 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 if you follow you, culture is about respectfully or perhaps not so respectfully appropriating things, reading them in the way that you read them because you may not know their context. And of course, knowing their context would make that experience richer. But um, this is a process that can't be stopped and I always find it should, actually mustn't be stopped because I always find there is to me a worrying es essentialism behind the idea that, you know, this multicultural model where you done, you happen to have been born in a Muslim family and all of a sudden somebody is designated the spokesman for the Muslim community and all of a sudden that person I mean I was speaking to a friend of mine Kenan Malik who is of um, Pakistani origin I believe um, but grown up in England and Kenan said when I was a young man we thought of ourselves as black because we were Marxist and we were not white and that was where we were standing. And I didn't think that the local imam who had been designated as the spokesman for the Muslim community was speaking for me, although I came from a Muslim family. Of course. And all of a sudden you see this sort of essentialism that arises when you decide what is an authentic cultural voice. 
and then it becomes sort of pickled and um, it can no longer live. And of course, if you can't culture appropriate, you can also not read anymore. Absolutely. No, it's and it's very hard to draw a line, you know, when when does when is the good circulation end and when does the bad cultural appropriation begin? And sometimes you can see that, you know, culture thrived by crassly misunderstanding something. I, I totally agree. But and I think I'm going to use the word ethos again, even though I'm probably going to get into trouble. But for me, it's OK. So what do we do? We we can't draw the line. We can't sort of outlaw this stuff and shouldn't. I think you're right. But I think what we can do and what, you know, you and I as educators, people in the public humanities, I think what we need to do and should do is create sort of an ethos of deeper understanding to invite people that it's exciting to learn more about, you know, if you're going to use henna tattoos, learn something of because it's actually fascinating. Um, uh, and, you know, really good banh mi sandwiches. I had one yesterday are really great. And so, uh, you know, think of it as an invitation um, to to go deeper, to learn something. Uh, and it's true if you don't know anything to come back to example you used about Persian music, it's very hard to, you don't even know what to listen for. But, you know, you could make it a project and with a little bit of effort and curiosity and opportunities, you can actually could actually start to learn something about Persian music. And that would probably be very interesting. And then, you know, maybe one day the Tokyo Symphony Orchestra will uh, will play uh, some kind of mashup between Beethoven and Persian music. That's sort of what Goethe imagined when he wrote the West as the divan and so that's uh, that would be cool i always um try to for myself for my own understanding draw a parallel with languages um well it uh, i think the importance of the medium is really is is really relevant to me here you I know mean, if you have a musical idea you cannot communicate it with anyone unless you choose an instrument. You can sing it or play it on piano, etc. And it will go if it will give its inflection to your idea. It will make it something different. And whatever f act of communication you try, you have to use a language that will give things its own imprint, allow you to articulate certain things easily and certain things not at all. I mean, there's this wonderful story by my good old friend Diderot, um, where he imagines that there was an expedition that went to Tahiti um, and they persuaded one of the natives there to come back to France. And after a while, they actually sent him back and he got back safely. And it was, for once, not a terrible story of broken trust and exploitation. But Diderot imagines what he will tell the people back home about his experiences. And somebody asks him and he says, I will say no nothing. And they say, but why would you say nothing? And he, say, he says, well, because the, our words don't have, our language doesn't have the words to express this and people would think I'm lying. And yes, how do you explain people a coach if you don't know about horses and wheels and roads? Um, your language, of course, describes the horizon of your knowledge and of your possibilities. And that's why it always seems to me such a wonderful enrichment to learn a new language, to learn a new way of being, or to pollute your own language, and I say pollute quite, quite uh, consciously, with influences from something else, to make it evolve, to help it develop, and to help have a living culture. Because this is, of course, like what languages are. They are made out of bits and pieces of other languages. Uh, um, yeah, but it's it. You you keep coming back. I feel like to this question of a kind of shared tradition or shared language, since language has to be shared, uh, and that a certain tradition is allows you, gives you the op possibility in the first place to articulate something or and and to share it and create express it in an instrument or a medium or a, a total system or, uh, you know, a visual culture. And I, I think that's true. 
Um, and this is why it's important to invite people to learn more about them rather than just kind of, you know, picking and choosing randomly. And of course, you know, the, it, this has become so easy on the Internet. And it's interesting that some of these, you know, this worry about cultural appropriation is at its height right now when, you know, the so social media are so pervasive and where the sharing of something is so easy and also so superficial. So I think there is a kind of historical reason also why at this point, even though it's often articulated in terms of, you know, the aftermath of European colonialism and, and, and a certain identity politics, as you say, I think the media culture environment is at least as important for explaining why we're so worried about cultural appropriation now. Um, so I, I, I think you're right to, you know, emphasize that cultural traditions are sort of affordances is one term, you know, that allow people to, to create culture. I think that's true. But I would, so I would go part of the way with you because I also, I wouldn't want to make it sound like, okay, in order to even begin to be a participant in a culture, you have to study it for 10 years. And, you know, that we, it's important to not raise the bar too high. And it's true that I've certainly found, and if you write about world culture, you know, I've had the experience again and again, where I had to immerse myself in, in, in a historical situation or an art form that I didn't know very much about. And I actually feel that, that with, you know, intense but dedicated study of a few months, you actually can learn a lot. And you also, of course, then realize everything you don't know about it and just how complex and difficult it is. But I wouldn't want to say, you know, you know, you have to go back to school if you want to, you know. No, but it's not, it's not so much a command. It's an open invitation. Yes, I agree. It's the fact that you learn and accept that by enlarging your vocabulary or by learning a new language, you learn new ways of being and of being in the world. And that, that in itself is a joy. That doesn't mean you need to be an expert on the Koto or on Beethoven to listen to that music. And you can simply find it beautiful. But there's so much richness to come. And interestingly enough, and I think that is also what you say about social media and sharing and the superficiality, it has become a super uh, it has become a commercial space where everything is simply an available product and you can understand that people are quite unhappy never mind the sort of as you say big money making interests and hegemonic sort of ideas of domination and subjugation but even so you know when you feel your identity means something to you and perhaps it's an identity that has been historically humiliated quite a lot then having stuff bandied about like that is not very helpful. But I've just tried to write a little book about the possibility of, new, of a new enlightenment, and I came to a conclusion that really surprises me. Um, and I'm still sort of a little bit baffled by it. But I, I decided, you know, obviously enlightenment is hugely compromised and you know you have to get through a lot of crap before you can even get to the point where you think it may be a good idea but it's no longer the nobility and the church that are the biggest problems today and you see that the but it is the great lies that a society tells itself perhaps and those lies today have a lot to do with the illusion machine that we live in that is created by, for us by a sort of digital and advertising conglomerate that we live in. And perhaps the interest in a new enlightenment would be punching through that wall. Um, and, you know, looking outside of the supermarket and see the land that all those products really come from uh, just vanishing um, to loss of biodiversity and to climate catastrophe. Um, but the conclusion that really did surprise me was that I found we are so much involved in this world because it's been created by very good psychologists after long trials. Um, and it's making us less and less competent. <laughs> 
I get recommendations on my iPhone for a particular photo filter. And they're no longer the photo filters of many years ago where they just sort of put a different gloss over the picture. But now this photo filter, which is jolly expensive and designed by some wonderful professional photographer, the software analyzes the space that you photographed and the objects in it and recreates them in 3D digitally gives them a new lighting and new sh shadows and all of that. And then you get the image back. And of course, your crappy photograph has turned into a little masterwork. Now, the interesting thing is, I play the violin, and I have done for a long time, and I'm a pretty mediocre violinist. If I won the lottery tomorrow or wrote a bestseller, I bought a Strad, a Stradivari. They cost millions. I would be a pretty mediocre violinist with a Stradivari. It would not make me a better musician. Practice makes me a better musician. And I think here's a very important difference. In this digital world, your incompetence gets camouflaged by something that you can purchase, by the right kind of filter that will make everything look completely different. In the analog world, you can't do that. And I found that it, it's probably really, really important to cultivate something physical, something bodily, a discipline, a learning path, because otherwise you get sucked up by that other world. Is that a completely weird idea? As a mediocre violinist myself, I... Oh, uh, well, I, 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 quartets are on the way. <laughs> I, I agree. And the violin, of course, is such a particularly thankless instrument that you just failure is so pre-programmed um, um, but it's it's sort of the embrace or so living with that failure uh, and there are periods when I stopped playing because I was so frustrated and it sounded so awful I once made the mistake of recording myself I couldn't believe how bad it sounded. I sounded much worse than what I was thought I was sounded like so um, if you haven't done that don't <laughs> Um, but then I sort of, at some point I got over it and sort of, I just enjoyed the practice. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, because I think in a weird way and probably again, in a mostly commercialized way, but maybe not only there is this new emphasis on practice and experiences and, and so on and so forth. And that, you know, much of it is totally commercialized, but I think, um, it nevertheless comes from perhaps a recognition that goes a little bit in your direction that that um, that you can't just be product oriented or perfection and, and all of that and that and that a practice like that is sort of an occasion. I come back to my hobby horse, um, which is the persistent influence of theology on our lives. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that the Enlightenment did as much to, to continue a theological thinking as it did to interrupt it, because it simply relabeled the, many theological ideas of the Christian tradition as secular ideas, and we no longer realize their theological nature. Humanity as being above and outside nature, human beings of being in need of being saved from themselves, um, of salvation, history as something that goes a place that is a good place to go to, um, the universality of the message. In fact, even enlightened reason and the Christian soul have a lot in common. And always the fact that we, you know, that the bodily aspect of our lives is the problem that we have. And I think I recognize that quite a lot in this digitized world as well. Um, but Listen, I, I really want to still pick your brains on one thing which seems very important and you, you've also devoted a book to it and it is, I think, one of the great questions of our times. Um, the book that I mean is Literature for a Changing Planet and I think you and I would agree, probably not all of our listeners, but a lot of them um, will agree that we are at the greatest turning point humanity has ever seen due to this climate catastrophe. And that one of the greatest problems is, first of all, I think that people are becoming psychological, not only, I mean, that people, that the science is not in all heads, but people are becoming, I think, increasingly aggressive because 
what one might describe as the collapse of the liberal narrative, also puts in question everything they stand for. In other words, you and I, we grew up in the same country at roughly in the same time, and I think we grew up in a country where we learned that our country was richer and more, and more peaceful than other countries because our values were better, because we were punctual and polite and not particularly corrupt and, you know, all those nice things. We didn't hear about the wars led on our behalf. We didn't hear about the destruction of nature and uh, etc., etc. That was also part of that story. So accepting where we stand today in terms of the climate catastrophe also means that the liberal narrative has failed, that we are not magically moving to a world of free markets and free democracies, but that, you know, that this idea of a linear progression towards some new Jerusalem uh, appears to be rather more complicated. Um, I think that is one big... But the other thing is simply failure of the imagination. Because if we have to think of something different from today, not more or less of the same thing, but something genuinely qualitatively different, then that requires a leap of the imagination that is actually quite difficult to make. And I was thinking also, because we did the last podcast with Andrea Wolf, um, you know, she writes about the fact that when Schiller's, uh, Friedrich Schiller's play, plays were first performed, people fainted in the theatres and started crying and sobbing. And I think one of the really important things is one of those leaps of the imagination because tragedies from the ancient Greeks to via Shakespeare um, had always meant that there was a natural order of things and that somebody is disturbing this natural order because of a character flaw or a tragic situation or being the child of the wrong person or whatever it is, this person is disturbing the natural order and the tragedy we're watching is the destruction of this person and the reestablishment of the order. And then come Schiller's figures, and they also die, and they also fail. But before they die, they say, it's the system that's wrong, not me. And I think that was such a moment when people really, or as Bruno Latour has said, you know, you have, first of all had to put a few ideas on stage, such as the people and justice and the common good, before you could have a revolution because people had to learn to think like that. So you are writing about literature for a changing climate. How do we have to learn to think today? How can we make this leap of the imagination? Yeah, no, it, it's so well put. And I think a similar train of thought led me to this book. And it's sort of two part. On the one hand, I wanted to see where do these where do the stories that have been floating around in our culture in our heads about the environment come from because often there you know the story about climate change sort of begins in the 18th and 19th century with the carbon economy and so on and so forth and that's of course important but i was really struck by the fact that that you can go back to the epic of gilgamesh and you know it's a story about urbanization it dismisses the wilderness it kills a monster who is a guardian of the forest and so that the city builders can go on a logging expedition because Mesopotamia is in chance nature to make it an economic resource. Exactly. And it's so explicit. It is astonishing. It's interesting. While it promotes it, it also shows it and it really we can inspect it. So this story is 4000 years old, you know, and so it really shows that in some sense what we are up against when it comes to trying to imagine a different uh, path, because this is not just, you know, we, it's not just we took a wrong turn 200 years ago, uh, uh, but it, this is much older. It has to do with settlement. It has to do with uh, intensive agriculture. It has to do with urbanization. And I love cities. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, but there, there, there's, there's a kind of cultural package here that, that, that got built uh, many thousands of years ago. And so it's about realizing that and basically rereading the canon of world literature with an eye towards that. But then the second and even more difficult task is the one you mentioned, maybe where do we go from here? And there too, I mean, in, if you look at the sort of average 
climate discourse or you know literature and movies above all you realize that you're retelling the same apocalyptic or another theological concept you know the apocalypse um um, and I think that, I mean, I'm, and I'm not the only one to say that those apocalyptic scare tactics, I think we are now realizing don't really work as well. Um, so I think that just on a purely strategic level, I think we need to avail ourselves of a much larger panoply of, of literary forms and try to understand what, what's actually the effect of these different genres. I'm thinking, for example, of comedy. I, st I started a little environmental writing uh, competition here amongst st for students, and some of the young students come, came up with great not ha 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 climate change is funny comedies, but because comedy is the genre that is best at describing everyday life, at impediments, imper imperfections, human failure. So there, I think there's something that they realized here that, you know, your, your, your average climate uh, uh, stories uh, uh, don't go. And then the larger goal that you mentioned of sort of basically reimagining a new world, which is, I think, why some people now from sci-fi and these other genre fictions are, are contributing to that. Uh, and I think that seems promising to me. Where do you see that? I mean, I think spontaneously, for instance, of Richard Power's Overstory, which was the first novel and the first novel that I would think is really a great work of literature that I read where I felt somebody's really trying to do something new here and I'm not being preached to, but the novel is written from a perspective that is so different that I'm gaining a different perspective myself. Yeah, I agree. And I think the reason why it's so good or why he is so good at it, because he has built basically his career on writing about science. And so I think that, and ideas, and some mostly scientific ideas. Uh, and I think it's a very, it's not something that the literary establishment really rewarded because these, they were often seen as, oh, this is just, you know, literature about science or literature of ideas. This is not high literature. Uh, but he just didn't, you know, he just continued to build this career. And it's, he, you know, I think all of his novels are really great and worth reading. Um, and, and he just managed to create a kind of, genre of a kind of science, not science fiction, but science novel or something like that, where he figured out a way of putting these two together and using the richness and complexity of science uh, and the adventure of science, and but also the mysteries that remain and weave them together and embed them in a kind of rich social world, the way in which the novel, you know, is still sort of the best genre that does that. Yeah. So I think it's I totally agree. Um, but it's also it shows how rare it is. And this is one of the challenges of climate fiction that you 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 it's very helpful to know something about science and climate science and how many fiction writers do not many and that's that's i think in part why what what his unique background and entire career if you will sort of prepared him i think uniquely to write that particular wonderful novel you deal so much with storytelling and we're coming to this moment today where we're thinking about how can we think about things differently um i've <clears throat> finished a book um It'll be published in English, I hope, next year. It's being translated at the moment. It's called Subjugation, and it's looking at the idea that, you know, what a strange idea it is that human beings can rule over, over nature and are themselves not of nature. And that uh, turns out to be quite an exceptional idea. Really, only the Mesopotamians came up with it. We know of no other culture that did in all other cultures. And then, of course, the Bible sort of brought it into much sharper focus because, and let me just take you through this very, very rapidly. So bef the, the biblical idea of Adam and Eve being put there to subjugate nature and rule over all the animals comes into a world that is animist, which means that you have to give a, make a sacrifice for all sorts of stuff. Why? Because you know that you're surrounded by other powers gods or demons or ancestors or whatever they are, 
and that you uh, that you mustn't piss them off and that they have interests and they have powers and therefore if you go to sea you have to make an offering to Poseidon etc so you're surrounded by different interests and then the bible comes and it really in an almost caricaturally patriarchal way it says no nature has no voice has no interests you can own it have it penetrate it plant your seed in it sell it um, it has no voice. And today with the climate catastrophe, we come back to the idea that the animist intuition wasn't so wrong. It's just the language that we no longer share. We no longer believe into the endless soap opera, soap opera of gods and goddesses um, having affairs and being angry with each other. And we now use the language of science. But the intuition that we are surrounded by other interests, that we are bound into systems that we can't escape, was actually not that wrong. Do you think that can be an inspiration for um, an artistic view of life? I think that's very interesting, but I'm looking forward to reading that book. Um, and it reminds me, uh, I think it's convincing, and it reminds me of the fact that within you know, sort of my world of eco-criticism, and I have lots of critical things to say about that field. But one of the interesting developments, I think, is that there is now much more interest in indigenous storytelling traditions in because we realize that our, you know, relationship to nature, exactly the way you describe it, has got, you know, is a dead end and or is incredibly destructive. So a kind of looking at the margins of that tradition or at what that tradition sort of papered over or marginalized or tried to destroy and recovering that and trying to recover that um, as a kind of imaginative resource as an alternative really to the, the tradition you describe. That's, I think, that's just starting and it's hard because there, you know, there is so much was destroyed, but it's also interesting to see that these some of these oral traditions and Native American traditions, for example, in the Americas, but not only here, are are more resilient than one would think sometimes. And so I think that that's an interesting project. For example, I worked with someone briefly in Florida who is from the Amazon and who has started to call has a wonderful collection of stories about water and land in the Amazon basin and uh, it's a great read. And so I think there's, I think that there are people, you'll find some like-minded people who are in very different ways uh, uh, share that uh, insight or intuition. How do you think we can get that plurality of voices that you describe? Um, a plurality of voices that ultimately is part of a philosophical revolution of the end of really 6,000 years of cultural history because we are beginning to understand we're not outside and above nature. Hang on. We are actually nature. There is nothing we produce that is not a product of nature. Um, and anyway, we share 98.5% of our DNA with chimpanzees, which is a difference that is just as big as between Indian and African elephants. Um, so this, you know, this is an enormous philosophical revolution, never mind the technological changes that climate change demands, etc. How do you think that can be part of the, the discussion, part of the societal conversation? I think, you know, you put that so convincingly and, and importantly, I think that we are at a moment culturally where we... I think where people in Europe, I just spent a year in Munich, uh, I think are beginning to realize that the old European stories about culture and domination are at an end and that there's, I think, you know, some awkward, some more convincing attempts to bring in new voices. Um, and I think this effort, which is important, is mostly presented as a kind of restitution or atonement very german thing to do it's a, an extremely german thing to do you know we win atonement um and you know i think that can be an important language and it you know as you point out in germany especially there's a kind of paradigm 
But maybe what's important is to emphasize what you said, the the necessity that we actually we're doing this not only because we feel so bad about the bad things we did in the past, we should do that too. But also because this is actually really important for, for us, for everybody. This is part of this cultural philosophical revolution that you that you mentioned that we all need. Um, and and that there is, you know, to put it in a slightly less nice way, even a self-interest out of our own self-interest, we should be doing that, not just as a because we are so morally, you know, refined that we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we are now willing to engage in acts of atonement. Oh, I'm a great fan of self-interest because it's, it's, it's a reliable motivation. Um, you know, if you know that somebody acts in his perceived self-interest, um, then at least you know that that person is relatively honest and serious. So um, if if we can convince people that it's in our self-interest to do that, I think that's all to the good. Um, people who are convinced that they're completely virtuous and know everything and have everything right are always a little bit scary. Um, listen, Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you and I'd love to go on but um, we've already spoken for an hour and um, I thank you very much for for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me and I can't believe that hour as you predicted went by, by so fast uh, uh, but it was great pleasure. They tend to and um, especially towards the end time is always galloping. Um, so thank you also for listening. And if you um, have questions, if you have angry objections, if you want to flatter us silly, or if you want to say anything else, do leave us a comment and get in touch. And above all, subscribe and make this podcast world-beating. And um, we're talking about domination. So well, Philip, Blom, uh, Philip Blom's podcast, The Blomcast, will uh, top all the charts. Of course, I'm certain that that will happen with you your help. Martin, um, you certainly would be a reason for this podcast to top every chance. So thank you for your time. And um, I hope we speak soon again. Mm -hmm.